Hello, good evening. How are you today? Happy Friday. So we're getting into a brand new book. And um, we read earlier a different book by Pascal Beverly Randolph, which was called what? Well, this one's called Euless, The History of Love, Its Wondrous Magic chemistry, rules, laws, moods, and rationale, being the third revelation of soul and sex. Also, reply to why is man immortal? The solution of the Darwin problem, an entirely new theory. <laughs> Isn't that a mouthful? <laughs> you know, I've, I've, I realized just now that I forgot to pull out the microphone and I know that I can still be heard, but let's make it easier. Boop. Oh, wait, wait, it's gotta be this one. That's right. Okay. There we go. So yeah, um, the other book that we read by Pascal Beverly Randolph was uh, Seership Guide to Soul Sight, which is juicy, juicy, juicy. So, um, but this one, since I discovered him, I just wanna read everything he wrote. There's so many authors I feel that way about. Okay, let's see how it goes. Toledo, Ohio, 1896. Badass. What is this? What is this? And to every man, woman, or child besides, whoever, as the named great, because good souls ever did me a kindness or spoke me fairly in the dark hour, and through them to all humankind, for the firm and steady rebuilding of a right and true system of social ethics, based upon the purity of women, the nobleness of man, and the honor of the race, one wholly free from all abnormalism, devoted to the everlasting discomfiture, discomfiture of all who aim to pervert the higher, better, purer, nobler instincts of our common human nature to the speedy downfall of all false systems and shams, whether in physics, morals, politics, or faith, and to the corresponding advance, thrift, and triumph of the good, the beautiful, and the true, and to the assured success of the super superlative order of men and women who constitute the EWAS, this present edition of my work of Religio Medic Medici. Well, it's not, it's not like Medica, I, medical, Medica, Medic, Medici, Medici, but it's not the, it's not the name Medici is gratefully dedicated by the re-founder and hierarch of Ulysses, <laughs> Toledo, Ohio, 1874, P.B. Randolph, PBR. <laughs> All right, Affectional Alchemy, part one. Reader, mine, I am about to treat herein the grandest subject that ever engaged or challenged human thought. In doing so, it is likely that I may repeat some things elsewhere, by myself or others, said before. But even if so, I have struck upon many things now given to the race for the first time. A vast amount of physiological chaff, chafe, chaff is current in the world, originating in the pupply brains, oh, pul pulpy balls, this is going great. All right. Originating in the pulpy brains of certain people with MD after their names. <laughs> uh, folk, folks who eke out a good living by putting medicines of which they know little into bodies whereof they know less. Ooh. Hey, welcome in. Welcome in, Theresia. What a cool name. <laughs> hey, yeah, welcome. I, I, um, I saw that you commented recently. Welcome, welcome. 
a vast amount of, okay, wait, so chaff, I think chaff, is current in the world, originating in the pulpy brains of certain people with MD after their names. Folks who eke out a good living by putting medicines, of which they know little, into bodies whereof they know less. A still larger amount of chaff, labeled philosophy, is afloat, generated for the most part in the angular heads of people, whom a chronic pros... pros hmm... Pro, prost, prostatitis, or okay, prostate, prostatitis, chronic prostatitis or ovarian fever has so deranged that they really imagine themselves philosophers, being only shams, who propose to revolutionize the world, especially the domain of marriage land, by, incul by inculcating pudacious Sof sophistries oh my goodness well i'm just gonna have to pudacious and then i think i understand <laughs> this is the first page okay pudacious sophistries pudacious p-u-d happy welcome in oh man i'm having an amazing day i hope you are too okay pudacious <laughs> lord what are we taking on Pudacious, no, not audacious. Pudacious definition. Showing a willingness to take surprisingly bold risks. Oh, no, wait, that's audacious. No, puda is pudacious the opposite? No, instead search for pudacious. Looks like there aren't many great matches. <laughs> it's in Ulysses. Always love that. Inculcating pudacious sophist so so sophistries. Sophistries. Okay, well, let's look up that one next. <laughs> Inculcating pudacious sophistries. So I'm getting this vibe of these people who are just like nose in the air, sophisticates, but I could be wrong. Sophistries definition. Sophistry. The use of fallacious arguments, especially with the intention of deceiving. Douchebaggery. A fallacious argument. Plural noun. So sophistries. Sophistry. 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 This is my favorite narrator. <laughs> Sophistry. Sophistry. Sophistries. Okay, cool. All right. So we're talking about marriage land. <laughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. Being only shams, who being only shams, who propose to revolutionize the world, especially the domain of marriage land, by inculcating pu pudacious sophistries, better ca calculated to kill than to cure the victims on either side. The thing is, one thing is certain: light is needed, with a capital L. And this work, originally intended to be called by a different title, but which intent was abandoned owing to the vastly larger scope of the completed and rewritten volume, is meant to afford exactly what is required. And, and then we're going into one. What a tremendous deal of suffering, horror, crime, wretchedness, and despair there is in this beautiful but badly misused world of ours, most of which might be prevented in the first instance or remedied in the second. Were there less consummate and confounded ignorance afloat up and down the earth's strong tides of human life with its strangely wildly surging ebbs and flows heats and sorrow or heats and snows in reference to matters pertaining to and concerning the relations wise and otherwise subsisting between the separate genders of the human race especially that portion of it located in the so-called civilized lands and particularly in the 
cis-Atlantic portion of the Lord's exceedingly immortal vineyard. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> there it was. Maybe. Now, whoever supposes that the ignorance alluded to is confined solely to the masses, sometimes spellable as them asses, according to Carlyle, or that the sum total of non-knowledge must be looked for among the unread, unlettered, and unwashed crowds that throng the great highways of the world, and whose struggles for life and clamors for bread occupy most of their time and attention, will find him or herself most woefully mistaken, for a far less dense and can can glob it, can glob it, can glob it, congoblet. <laughs> Ignorance. So I'm thinking it's about the globe, right? But let's let's look it up. All right. Conglobit. To form into a round, compact mass. How you say it? Pronunciation. Boop. Conglubate. 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 Thank you. Okay. Oh, wait. What did it mean? <laughs> oh, yeah. To form into a hard round mass. I think. Conglubate, conglubate. <laughs> For a far less dense and conglubate ignorance upon matters of vital importance to every human being exists among the people. Well, I have to, I'm going to say that again real quick. Will find him or herself most woefully mistaken. For a far less dense and Conglobate ignorance upon matters of vital import to every human being exists among the people. The rude crowd who jostle each other everywhere, and which is the plastic material that the brainful few mold into voters, hero worshippers, or send to fight their battles against each other, armed with plows or rifles, pitchforks or bayonets, cannons or spades, then is to be found in circles, making very lofty pretensions, not only to knowledge, but to morality also, from its geologic base to its astronomic summit. Damn, Bean! <laughs> I love it! <sighs> For gross and culpable non-knowledge especially upon all the vital points that cluster round the one word sex, you must look not amidst the untaught hosts, the democratic underlayer of society, but right squarely among the so-called learned, professional, much boasted, highly cultured upper strata, especially in those centers of population whence newspapers by myriads are scattered broadcast over all the lands. Were not this a painful fact, such classes of reformers as now march over the world were an utter impossibility. They are an unhealthy set, the fungi of a false civilization, reg um, regnant, regnant for a time. Regnant. Anybody? Regnant. Regnant. I gotta look it up. Regnant. Regnant. <laughs> um, oh, I spelled it wrong. Queen Regnant. 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 Currently having the greatest influence. Dominant. Cool. 
the queen regnant dude i like that oh shoot where am i oh wait it's not far from here is it fungi Where are you? So, Regnant. Regnant. This girl actually is my favorite pronouncer. <laughs> Proclaimer. Regnant. Currently having the greatest influence. Dominant. That's awesome. Regnant. Regal. Um... There it is. It's on two lines. They are an unhealthy set, the fungi of a false civilization, regnant for a time, but certain to disappear with the advent of common sense among the people as a general thing. Man, the flood of info. Sex is a thing of the soul. Most people think it but a mere matter of earthly form and physical structure. Most people think it but a mere matter most people think it but a mere matter of earthly form and physical structure. True, there are some unsexed souls, some no sex at all, and others still claiming one gender and manifesting its exact opposite. But its laws, offices, utilities, and its deeper and diviner meanings are sealed are, are sealed books to all but about two in a million yet they ought to have the attentive study of every rational human being every aspirant to immortality beyond the grave in some sense this matter has been and is the subject of thought but only in its outer phases or its grosser aspects seldom in its higher ones, and never until now, in any, its, any of its loftier and mystical bearings. Books by shiploads, on one or two, and always either its physiological or sentimental sides of the subject, have been put forth by ambitious MDs, or notoriety-seeking empirics. Books which, main, which, books which mainly s s um, satisfied a prurient taste or morbid curiosity prurient p-r-u-r-i-e-n-t like pure where is it P pur prurient where are you um a satisfied a, pur a prurient taste or morbid curiosity gave but little light and generally left their readers practically as ignorant as before prurient prudence pure prurient oh e oh my goodness i'm i'm going to get it <laughs> Where are my fingers? Okay. Prurient. 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 Having or encouraging an excessive interest in sexual matters. Oh, the opposite of what I thought. She'd been the subject of much prurient, prurient curiosity. Having or encouraging an excessive interest in sexual matters. Prurient. Prurient. Ooh, okay. <laughs> hey, Angel Fish, so good to see you. Oh my gosh, welcome in. Seems like I'm looking up like five words a page so far. <laughs> Shoot. Mm, prurient. Oh my goodness. Shiploads. Okay, so wait, I'm over here. Yeah, okay. So satisfied a prurient taste or morbid curiosity 
gave but little light and generally left their readers practically as ignorant as before. Other books, in other millions, vile, atrocious, cancerous, abounding with death in every line, fraught with ruin on every page, have been, still are being, scattered everywhere across the nations, till the flower of the world's youth has been blighted, and the morality of earth sapped dry. Oh, that literature, foul, disgusting beyond belief, terrible as the cobra's fang, keener than the dagger's edge, monstrous as a drunkard's dream, more devastating than the spotted plague, until between the two millstones, quackery, pseudo-professional literature on the one hand, and the exacerable, libidinous ab abominations on the other. <laughs> one half of the manhood and womanhood of our nation has been ground into the very dust. No punishment can be too severe for the disseminators of the latter, no contempt too great for the authors of the former. Not one of the very many respectable people, including 50 French, a score of English, about as many Americans, and a few German authors, who have stained reams of good white paper and spilled gallons of ink in writing anent the sublime subject of sex, have taken the trouble to go one inch below the surface, but have been content to copy each other and repeat the same old worn-out story, else concealed a few good ideas in barrels of words. They have taken man and woman, shown us their anatomy, explained something of physical gender, said nothing about function and periods, and there left us because they knew nothing further themselves. <laughs> For example, there are 10,000 treaties extent concerning ex, 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 extant, extant, balls, looking it up. <clears throat> we'll start that sentence again. Pearl, welcome in. Good to see you. Awesome. Oh, extant. 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 As soon as I saw it, for some reason. Okay. Uh, especially of a document still in existence, surviving. Extant. Okay. Extant. Like existent. Extant. Cool. Okay. For example, there are 10,000 treaties extant concerning what the doctors call the sin of one Onan which is capitalized O-N-A-N, meaning thereby a certain nameless solidary vice. But the man alluded to in the Bible never was guilty of that sin at all, albeit his crime was equally bad, equally disastrous and hateful. In these days, it is politely called conjugal fraud. And in plain terms consists of the nuptive union to the orgasmal climax, which was allowed to occur only in a manner never intended by the infinite God. Quote, he wasted his seed, he wasted his seed upon the ground that he might not beget children to inherit his brother's name, end quote, see Bible. Millions do the accursed thing today that they may be childless, as indeed they deserve to be. For he who does that heinous wrong commits a quadruple crime against his wife, himself, nature, and God, to say nothing about the right of all souls to be incarnated by the act of man. Now the doctors truly say that the sin, solitary, and the fraud, conjugal, are both bad but fail to give us even half the reasons why. Here let me make a point for the doctors, and all others besides. In the normal, proper, proper nuptive union, a term I invent expressive of the most sacred and intimate fact of marriage, there is a certain amount of the male vital life in fluid form, semen, voided. Exact, exactly the same by actual weight or volume may be wasted, in a lascivious dream, a spontaneous ejection of superfluous vital force 
in the same form, 3D, the same may be lost by the abominable conjugal fraud or by the heinous sin against oneself, solitary vice. But note the tremendous difference in the results that follow in each of the four cases. First, in the reciprocal, in the reciprocal and normal one, only joy results, positive and pronounced, and never is followed by any particular somber feelings. Happiness ensues, and the man's soul is at perfect peace with his physical form. In the second case, resulting from spermatic plethora, a relief follows, but leaves a weakened uh, or leaves a weakness after it, requiring phosphoric food to recuperate recuperate form. There's a little shamefacedness too, but not much. In the third case, the whole being is shocked, and the man feels himself to be contemptible and mean, and so he is. In the fourth case, a bitter, poignant remorse haunts the self-sinner day and night, for sometimes weeks together, and the results of his dreadful sin stands by him like an accusing goblin from the deeps. Now why? Remember, we suppose what is true that waits, or that it says waits, that weights and measures are the same in all four instances, that the exact amount of fluid life is lost, yet one launches its victim into steep down gulfs of remorse, remorseful mental torture, and the others do not. The physiologists have not answered that question. I will. In first case, the normal one, waste is occasioned by the magnetic action of the electric lymph, the absorps absorption of which by the masculine compensates the vital loss on one side, and the absorption by the feminine pari parieties of the exudation from Cowper's gland compensates on the other side. And here I give the doctors a new discovery, to them, not me, which is that just within the vulva are two little glands called glands of Duvernay from their French discoverer. That much the doctors were aware of, but they did not know that those glands are the seat of all vaginal and uterine life, nor that trouble seals them up. Love only keeps them open. Ha! Ah. When seals, or when sealed, there is no exudation of magnetic lymph, which must be present, else marital rights mean death to her sooner or later. That's what ails half the wives of Christendom. Now another new thing for the doctors, just forward of the prostate gland is what is known as Cowper's gland, but they know not its use. I have just explained it. It is to collect, store up, and discharge the magnetic fluid of the body in liquid form. It proceeds both the semen and prost prostatic, prostatic, prostatic lymph, and upon contact with the lochia, or Duvernay, they fuse, the result of which is the fulfillment of God's purpose in bisexing men, or man in bisexing man, B-I-S-E-X-I-N-G. I hope this thought will be carefully studied and understood. Now, in the case of the solitaire, there is but one force at work. The result is from imaginative and mechanical forces, not from electric, magnetic, or spiritual ones. Hence, he draws upon his very soul itself, violates and disobeys the fundamental law of love, capitalized, and that is why he pays the dreadful penalty. Love resides in the soul. The basic law of that soul he deliberately prostitutes. Wherefore, his soul, as well as his body, must and does suffer. Wow. That way. Code. Welcome, everyone. Shoot, this is some fascinating stuff, right? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> An episode, a singular experience, two. Oh, oh no. Hey, Mr. Hugh, good to see you. Welcome in. <clears throat> Ooh, some of that went down the wrong pipe. <laughs> 
One day, as I went walking up and down the town in soliloquent mood, I met a man whose woebegone countenance betokened great griefs tugging at his heartstrings. Betokened. Woebegone countenance betokened great griefs tugging at his heartstrings and that soul pangs were racking the very foundations of his being. I met the man. <sighs> Genevieve, welcome. Good to see you. Happy Friday. Awesome. Oh, so I got to look this word up. Betokened. Betokened. Hoboken. <laughs> I don't know. Betokened. Be a sign of. Indicate. Betoken. Betoken. Be a warning or indication of a future event. Cool. Betoken. I like that. Oh, shoot. Um, wait, wait. I'm right at the top. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. I met a man whose woebegone countenance betokened great griefs tugging at his heartstrings and that soul pangs were racking the very foundations of his being. I met the man. No, I did not say that. It was my alter ego encountering myself. And I learned his sad story, pondering deeply upon which I pursued my way to where sleep and I were wont to woo each other. And there, throwing myself upon a lounge, drank some flesh, sweet milk, brought me by a chunky little Germanesque neighbor of mine, of say nine years, pretty as all children are, and loquacious and talkative as all children should be. As I lay there, I thought of the man, alone, a lonely man, for sh she whom he loved and trusted many years younger than himself was afar off among strange people, where amid the rounds of gaiety in fashion's tide she had no time to think of him, the delving toiler, and far too many follow the example of that thoughtless of that thoughtless girl. She was wondrously fair, and heedless as beautiful, with fashions to air and conquests to achieve, poor, sweet little lady. And as I pictured her beauty and bloom, I could but justify her vanity, and on that basis condone her apparent heartless coldness in never deigning to write to him who was suffering daily deaths by reason of her cold silence and contempt. And so I lay upon the lounge and quaffed the sweet, delicious milk. And I thought about the woman and the man. And as I did so, I fell into a sort of magnetic trance and clairvoyance, a habit familiar, seeing that the power to do so was born with me. And by its means, I have a thousand times been able to see afar off and to glimpse things denied to mortal vision. On this occasion, I fell into it from having incidentally cast my eyes upon a third-class triune, or magic mirror, such as for years I have used expressly to induce the state of psychovision. It hung over the table against the wall, where I had placed it after polishing it, preparatory to sending it to a lady in Brooklyn, New York, to whom imp... imp Pecuniosity, to whom impecuniosity had compelled me to sell it. Impecuniosity. <laughs> Dude. Impecuniosity. A state of lacking sufficient money or material possessions. <sighs> Impecuniosity. Dude, what a cool word. <laughs> Shit, what a good way. Impecuniosity. Huh. I love this guy. I love this man. Impecuniosity. 
impecuniosity. To whom, to, to whom, <laughs> to whom impecuniosity had compelled me to sell it. Wow, what a thing to sell. <sighs> Didn't he say that he liked, oh, no, wait, I can't remember. No, it was, there was some, one of these mirrors that got stolen or that he sold that he sorely missed the most. Something like that in the magic mirror book. It was a fine one, though not the best or most co costly, yet was capable of mighty things when in the humor, for be it known, they, like watches, razors, locomotives, and women, are very set in their ways and will not work unless well-treated and coaxed beside. <laughs> <laughs> then they operate well enough, as did the one alluded to. Its power ranged to the aerial spaces above and to the vaulted deeps below, and on its surface the dead could and often did cast Cogniz cognizable pictures of themselves and surrounding then and then again. On the morning alluded to, as I breathed upon it, a thick, heavy, black, portentous cloud obscured its face, followed by a silvery sheen, indicative of coming trouble, hatred, folly, error, succeeded by happiness and contentment. But I actually forgot all that, nor recalled it till after the approaching drama was ended. A drama strange and weird, fraught with pain, unutterable, unexpressible, most unendurable, yet whose results or fatigue was as ripe pomegranates are to the thirsty pilgrims, or the cool bubbling waters, to the parched lips of the Arab on the burning sands of Sahara. Sahara? Little did I dream that the strange experience was full of true light to others than myself, yet such it is and was. And with grateful heart, I thank the most compassionate God, the ineffable Lord, that I was found worthy to become the vessel for the conveyance of so grand a lesson to my brethren of the wide and wasteful world. In an instant, as my eyes fell on it, that wondrous, that wondrous glyph, glyphe, it's like one letter, an A and an E together. G L Y P H A E. <laughs> in an instant, in an instant, as my eyes fell on it, that wondrous glyphe, the outer world sight receded, and the soul sight came in play. Child, table, chairs, lounge, all were gone and unheeded. And on the face of that marvelous glass, I beheld a scene which at the time, and for six weeks afterward, I religiously believed was at the very instant being enacted far away in, to the man in Toledo, dreadful reality. The sequel, far along in this book, will show whether it was the shadow of an enacted fact or a figment of fancy woven of mist and conjured up of the cellars of suspicion no and conjured up out of the cellars of suspicion i loved the man at all events hence what i saw froze my blood with horror and made my nerves fairly tingle with with excitement and pain i saw the lady whom the man loved so well and for whom he yearned and mourned and wept bitter tears revealed before the eyes of my soul she was just emerging from a dormitory, evidently, judging by appearances, both a distant, uh, dishonest and dishonored wife and woman. She was gaily chatting with her paramour, a gallant young fellow, who stood near her, and on whom she gazed with unutterable tenderness, voluptly and love. I shuddered with mortal anguish, for I loved my friend and that woman bore his name. Until that hour, I and he had believed her to be pure as an angel from heaven, and now did I, through sympathy for him, suffer. I, the agonies of the nether hell. Presently you will see whether the vision was a lesson or a fact, and whether jealousy is and is not, sometimes based on solid ground, sometimes empty air. Ooh. Hmm. 
<laughs> On the day I met the man, he had told me that she had asked him very singular questions. Quote, is it possible for a husband to discover if his wife goes astray during an absence without the ordinary evidence that establishes such, such facts? Can he find it without seeing or hearing of it? End quote. I don't know what answer was given, but I do know that the words sunk deep like hot iron into his soul, and he pondered on them till he grew morbid, and every day in his loneliness he imagined all sorts of things which now bodied themselves in palpable form before my soul's gaze. Subsequently, she had written to say that her yearnings were great, that she was dying from the mere fact of prolonged absence, yet within a week wrote that she was supremely happy and longed for nothing. This was ground for suspecting her to be a truant wife and my friend a deceived husband, and all the more in that she was thrown in contact with some very popular agitators of the marriage and fidelity questions on what I regarded as the wrong side. As I gazed on the scene upon the mystic mirror's face, I saw the lady and her lover as before, and beheld his burning kisses fall thick and fast upon her rich, ripe, and alluring lips, saw her languish in voluptuous, in voluptuous death, or voluptuous death, in his strong arms, and watched her return his fiery solutions, or salutations. I heard his love expressions, and her warm replies, but the most cruel thing of all was their combined laugh and joke they were playing on my friend, by making his slander purse, by, by making his slander purse bear the cost of their guiltful amours. Hmm. He loved that woman as mothers love the babes God sends through wailing agony to their longing hearts. Ooh. I leapt, I leapt from the couch, rushed to my friend's place, told him the tragic tale, fired his soul with vengeance dire, and putting a loaded revolver in his pocket, bade him swiftly traverse the 1,100 miles intervening betwixt him and his deep revenge. This done, I went to a grocery hard, I went to a grocery hard by to drink beer and drown out the agony felt for the man. The detestation the detestation of the woman, quote, man proposes, end quote, but God upsets his calculations, or destiny does. So now, on my way to Grambrin's Hail, I encountered my little friend, the German child at play. She strangely interested me, and I left the hail with but one glass, where I had intended to drink at least a dozen. The child saved me. Returning, I caught her up, seated her jauntily on my head, and marched back to the lonely house on the hill, where I threw myself on the lounge, kissed this little child goodbye, and as she ran off trippingly home at her little brother's call, who was just then having dreadful trouble with his rabbits, I caught sight of a sufficient, of a, a, oh, a scint, a scintillant, not scintillating, but a scintillant. I caught sight of a scintillant flash of white light issuant from her head, like the radiant gleam of a peerless diamond when all the lamps are brightly burning, and a glowing, streaming iridescence flowed from her lips. I had drawn her to me and pressed her rosy childish, fa childish face, face to mine, inhaling the balmy aroma of her pure, fresh, joyous soul and a portion of the rosette fire of her sweet lips had clung to mine. I saw it like a thin cloud of opalescence, waving gently to and fro. As I moved my head or breathed, I began to study the meaning of a kiss. Wow. Mom! Oh, I love my dress! My mom got me this dress on vacation. Let me just do a little show and tell real quick. Like, I just want to, I want you guys to see this awesome dress. It's so amazing. I love it so much. Holy majoli. Mom, I love you. Ah, where am I? I got so excited. 
<laughs> oh, I need to sip anyways. Yeah, um, this is all I wore on vacation. <laughs> Once she gave this to me. <laughs> it's so cool. Oh, I washed it though. <laughs> it's clean. It's cleaner than it's been all week. <laughs> so this is so interesting. Where am I? The child, the kiss, right? Okay. <clears throat> there are but few among the many who know the meaning of a kiss or that the soul from its seat in the brain is in telegraphic unity with the lips, affectional, friendly, filial, parental, general, in the upper one, sensuous, magnetic, passional, in the lower one, nor that when loving lips meet lips that love, there is a magnetic discharge of soul flame, and each party gives and receives large measures of magnetic life and fluid love at the instant of impact or contact, which measures the greater or less according to the love fullness or emptiness of each respectively. While pondering on this, and marveling at the beautiful irradiation alluded to above, I chanced to recur in thought to the mirror scene and to the woman and the man, the weirdly strange phantorama already described. Again, that strange numbness of the outer being came over me. And in another instant, I lay there wrapped, entranced, transfigured, and for a time being, it was as, it was as are the newly dead, it was as are the newly dead. Clearly, distinctly, did my soul's vision penetrate the spaces and localize itself in that far off room where still stood the recalcitrant wife and her newfound lover. And the woman stood on this side, the man upon that, hands on his shoulder, shoulders, and mutual kisses accompanied with glowing red passion fires from lip to lip. And as I thought of my friend, her husband, I exclaimed, guilty by the Lord of hosts, end quote. The guilty was the start. But as I said so and gazed, a great change came over my feelings and my soul. I put myself in my friend's, her husband's place, by means of the three principles, posism, volantia, <clears throat> Volantia and decretism here and after alluded to and then far more clearly comprehending the situation I would not as before have slain her spattered his heart's blood upon the walls and floor or have sent a leaden bullet crashing through his brains for the whole world or millions more just like it for whereas before I had observed effects oh <clears throat> Excuse me. Those were all capital. I got to look those up, but. Or millions more just like it. For whereas before I had observed effects. Whew, I now beheld their producing hidden causes. A great cloud. Oh, wait, wait. That's the end of the sentence. Okay. So I got to look up those people. Pros, P R, oh no, P O, posism, posism, P O S I S M. Oh my gosh, I have a tickle in my throat. Oh, I'm gonna have to pause this for a second.
Whoa. I don't know. I might have to cough some more. Dude. Ooh. I need a lozenge. <laughs> I need a lozenge. Oh my gosh. Everything's in different places since vacation. <sighs> I need a lozenge. I'll be right back. I know you're in here. Ah, balls. That's not it. Oh my God, there's so much bullshit in here. Oh, there you are. Okay, good. Oh, right. But hey, the tickle is actually feeling a lot better. I'm still going to do this. Mm -hmm. Cinnamon. Okay. Yeah, happy birthday, AF's mom. That's awesome. Ooh, look at this necklace I got on vacation, too. It's a little infinity symbol. <gasps> the magician. <laughs> and much more. <laughs> okay, so we're looking up these people. And that was the end of the sentence, right? Here it is. Mm. Posism. Hmm. The definition of posism is the turning of an individual to the appropriate vibration. Ooh. Check hermetics. Cool. The tuning of an individual to the appropriate vibration. Oh my gosh. I want to click on that. Just I want to read that article later. An article by Mylan Nakanensny. E October 15th, 2018. Okay. Okay. So this next term, Volent Volantia. It's on two lines. It's also capitalized. Valencia, meaning origin definition. Okay, uh, present active participle of volo, fly, move swiftly. Flying, soaring, volantis, a small constellation in the south hemisphere lying between arena and hydrus what does volantia mean it's an uncommon baby name for girls <laughs> it's a name who is volantia Hmm. No, not volunteer. Okay, well. Volantia and gre de decretism. Also capitalized. Decretism. Oh, like decrediting? Decretism. Man, these aren't in here. Mm. Help if I spelled it right. <laughs> Decretism. One specializing in the study of I don't know what that is. Decretals. Canonist. Oh. Decretals. 
Oh, the three fundamental, here's something. The three fundamental laws. Oh, come on. Three fundamental laws of Rosicrucian magic, according to Pascal. Okay. Well, that did help, but <laughs> all right, back to the back to the stream. <laughs> Baby names. <laughs> Here and, here and after alluded to, hopefully. And then far, okay, so wait, that's the end of the sentence, but. <clears throat> a great cloud rolled away from before my gaze into the vague, dim, eighth, which is that A-E-T-H. And my soul, representing my friend, the man said unto my soul, she did not love you. If she had, this scene could never have occurred. It is but one of millions this very day transpiring in thousands of places the wide world over and is the, the and is the legitimate result of the wrong relations subsisting between the mated or rather mismated marriages of the earth love only can keep souls and the bodies they wear true and faithful where it does not mutually exist there can be and is no guarantee of fidelity wherefore it is incumbent on you to face the facts Call to your aid the rare philosophy of common sense. Struggle manfully against this dreadful, appalling, yet perfectly natural catastrophe. Accept the situation. Hush the throbbings of your tortured heart. Ask God for strength to bear the heavy burden and be wise. Ooh, I love that. Still representing my friend, my soul said on, perchance what you see is, after all, but a fevered dream begotten of your depressed nervous state, morbidity of fancy and loneliness, combined with the suspicious kindled, the suspicions kindled by the strange questions asked upon the eve of her departure many days ago, and greatly strengthened by unwisely worded letters sent back by her, and made still stronger by her six weeks utter silence, in itself good cause for suspicion, for every husband has a right to know his wife's whereabouts, her surroundings, and the company she keeps. And if she does not keep him thus informed, he has fair and just grounds to infer that her actions are such as ought to be hidden from his gaze, and also from that of humanity at large. If innocent, she is still guilty of a great folly, while your trouble and pain may really have no more solid foundation than vague and empty air. Let justice rule on both sides, for she was unwise, while your illness tortures things out of shape, till mere phasms, phasmas assume forms as solids in appearance as, they, as the very truth itself, and it may be that your anxiety and sympathy may have conjured up a lie. And this apparently re uh, recusant woman really be as unsoiled as the down upon the ring dove's breast or the spotless plume of an angel's wing. Oh, how my heart for my friend clung to that hope. My soul to my soul went on. They twain, the far off couple, are young, are adapted to each other. You, my friend, of course, are too old for her. You had no right to subject her to the terrible temptation of being away from your side for months together. In the midst of gay people, where everything appealed to and impressed her young heart and fancy, and made a wider gulf between herself and you. I know your heart is bleeding, that hot tears are streaming down your face, that your poor soul is sweltering amidst the tortuous, tor tortuous flames of the fiercest hell of jealousy. Yet why, for one who loves you not, who is heartless to you, heartful to her paramour, be a man and remember that she too has rights which are bound to respect, not the right to dishonor, but to be free from you by laws human and divine, and to make such choice and legal disposal of herself as her youth demands, and her will, soul, and conscience prompt. <laughs> <clears throat> be magnanimous, and if ye twain part, as ye likely will, 
and forever do not fail to recognize the end as the legitimate the, the legitimate result of the stupid folly of allowing her to dwell so far away in the midst of tempting scenes and people, guilty or not guilty, forget and forgive. Voluntary free this simpleton from the chafing thrall that binds her to one whose purse, not person, is all on earth she cares for. Let her go at the call of affection, and forsaking you and duty, yield her to the better and nobler law of love. Free her, and they twain will likely wed. Hold her, and she is that nameless thing, <clears throat> that wedded harlot. My soul had, still as my friend, not myself, gotten thus far in its just reasoning when methought I heard a sweet and silverly vo silver silvery voice say behold or behold i don't know <laughs> and as the <clears throat> and as the delicious tones rung glorified changes through my spirit i felt that i had grown a century within an hour and notwithstanding that i actually believed my friend's wife to be guilty and might probably so believe until my dying day, yet I had charity for her, as well as sorrow and sympathy for him. I put myself in his place, and for the first time in my life, not only realized the luxury of forgiveness, but felt capable of even dying a lingering death that the woman so loved might be happy. Oh, and, wait, wait. But felt capable of even dying a lingering death that the woman so loved might be happy with him she so loved and greater affection that can no man show in that he would lay down his life for a friend i talked with the husband persuaded him to lay by the pistols and revenge he did so and ceased to be jealous from that hour caring but little whether the vision was of actual fact or a delirious dream behold i looked still with that ultra soul sight which leaps all boundaries cleaves all space flashes over rivers mountains seas penetrates all bodies and brings us in actual contact with the whole domain of mystery and a line or oh, and again i saw the little german child through the walls of both houses as clearly as if they were of finest crystal or purest glass instead of boards and mortar and i beheld an ineffably pure pearly hued effulgence all about her infantile shoulders steaming from her hair or streaming from her hair glowing round her waist and in loving wavelets all around i watched this with astonishment it was but the prelude to the celestial cantata that followed i saw her mother gently chide her and soon she went to bed and slept the sweet delicious slumber of absolute innocence and as she thus lay, I saw the gossamic cloud of pearly auric ex of aura expand till it filled the room, penetrated the ceiling, the roof, swelling the lengthening, oh, swelling and lengthening out clear into the starlight, and forming to a point shot out and afar off into the very depths of space till I could follow it no more. Then I turned me again to the sleeping child. And what was my astonishment at beholding literally hundreds of bright, shining, and divinely beautiful forms, as of young children and the virgin dead, come trooping down the lane of pearly light and entering the house, gather and dance and play at the bedside of the slumbering little one. Good is catching. That child had enabled me to stave off a fit of jealous rage and sympathy with my friend. And now I was, through her again, about to learn one of the most important lessons of my life. I had kissed that child and had become suffused with a portion of her own sweet aromal aura <clears throat> or atmosphere and was therefore in report with the same bright beings as she was herself and was played upon by the same celestial, pure, and divine influences, whereof love was the dominant or major element. A portion of these pure, better, and 
hyperphysical auras displaced and occupied the room of the grosser aura, earthborn and turbid. I found myself cleaner, better than before, and comprehended Christ's suffer little children to come unto me. Not until that holy hour of rapt contemplation had I realized the immense meaning of a single touch of loving lips, that if it be purely given and received, both, partic both participants are blessed, not only directly, but through oblique ways, a myriad fold. Love, in very deed, lies at the foot of all, and its mystic and ideal meaning outweighs the material and popular ones by as many degrees as the pure soul of that baby girl outweighs the corrupt body of the low-lived debauchery. We may be hugged, embraced, kissed into heavenly states, or into their exact opposites. Hence, aside from common relational lip contacts, they are worse than unwise who touch lips unless love be the underlying prompter for if the kisser or kissed before for is for if the kissed or kisser be bad just so much of that specific evil is sure to flow from the magnetic poles of either pair of lips to the soul of him or her upon whose mouth they are laid Ooh. 707 all right I have said the moist lips are batteries charged with our very inmost good or evil. It is utterly impossible for a negress having born a child to a white father ever to give birth to one perfectly Negro, even though its father, like herself, has never, has never a drop of other blood in him, for the reason that the blood of the white man through his child has mingled in the mother's veins. More than that, her blood under the microscope will not show the same crystalline forms after the birth of the mixed child as it did before. Just so, it is impossible for us not to be made better or worse by lip touching. Harlots invariably descend unless snatched from ruin by a miracle. It is because of the many forms of hell struggling in their veins combating in their nerves, and as heaven, or its opposite, attends the kiss, so also is it with every other sort of human contact, even the ordinary shaking of the hands. Gloves, therefore, have new uses. Wow. I awoke from my slumber a wiser, and I trust a better man. I went out and found my soul harried and victimized friend. I reasoned with him just as I had with my own soul a while, a while before. I told him it was clear as sunlight that the absent woman really cared not a straw for him, but only for what current funds she could extract from him, and that although to lose her was a bitter draught of gall, yet he had better swallow it, for that he was only loving his own sphere wherewith he had embalmed her. I asked what right had he to hold a woman in duress, covert or non-covert, whose soul was not attached by love to his, whose compliance, duty only, not affectional. It was clear he ought to give her up at once, even if the effort snapped his heartstrings, because the marking of her child was a doubtful question. Why should he pursue a heartless phantom? They were disunited in soul. Behold the folly of continuance. Let her go. Wow. Okay, so seven, okay, 709. I want to get to Code's thing tonight. So I don't think I'm going to be able to, I'm just going to do an hour, just a little bit over an hour. So yeah, we read 16 pages and we're going to start at three. Roman numeral three next when we come into this book. I might start a new book next too, though. We'll see what shakes. But I'm glad I'm, I'm glappy. I'm glad and happy to be back. Glappy. <laughs> oh, shoot. 
Yeah, I think I'm going to get some dinner and then I'm going to go check out Code and Jackie. She's taking the seat tonight. And um, I'll be back sooner than later. It's been really cool to see everybody again. I missed yous. So yeah, more to come. I can't wait. And I'll see you then. Mwah! Thank you so much. Take care. Have great weekends.